And now, Lord, we're going to look to your word. We're excited about that, Lord. We're excited about what you've been teaching us through this book of Ecclesiastes. And now as we come to the end, we pray for it to make sense. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, so we're in the book of Ecclesiastes in chapter 12, in verse 1. And if you um, not sure where that is, it's kind of to the middle, but a little bit to the right. If you find Song of Solomon, it's right before that. It's the book right before there. So Ecclesiastes chapter 12, if you don't have a Bible with you, and you want to turn there, we have spare Bibles we can loan to you. So if you need one, just let us know. Raise your hand, or you can get up and get some on the back table there. I just We want to make sure you have a Bible in your hands, whether it's on a phone or a tablet or whatever. But it's an important thing to do. Okay, so in case you need further proof that the human race is doomed through stupidity, here are some actual label instructions on current consumer goods. On a Sears hairdryer, now I don't know how current this is with Sears now, it says, do not use while sleeping. <laughs> it's like, man, that's the only time I had in my life to use it, you know. On Nitol sleep aid, warning, may cause drowsiness. It's like, you have to warn people that it's going to do what it says it's doing. On a Japanese food processor, not to be used for the other use. <laughs> On a bar of dial soap, directions, use like regular soap. So evidently, dial isn't regular soap. And the last one, on some Swanson frozen dinners, serving suggestion, defrost. <laughs> it's like the level of intelligence, if you want to call it that, is just really dropping rapidly. We think we're so much smarter. But I asked my doctor because he, he put me on a, an over-the-counter medication that says you could take it for three weeks, and then you had, it didn't tell you what to do after that. Stop. I said, not take it anymore. And I'm like, well, what good is that going to do me? He says, you can take it all the, every day. It's okay. They only have those warnings because there are lawyers in the world. <laughs> and I thought, okay. So I call this message, follow the directions. As you can see, you know, it's kind of like the scarecrow. Some people go both ways. All right. So verse one, remember now your creator in the days of your youth. So the word remember means pay attention to, consider with the intention of obeying. So Solomon has given us a hint of what's to come at the end of this book. Now, I'm just going to say this. If you're a younger person, and there are a few of you here today, it's so important to know God, to believe in God, to yield to him, to make him your savior and your Lord, and to do it now. Why? Well, first of all, I firmly believe that knowing God as Savior and Lord is the single most important thing any of us can do ever in our entire lives. And it actually, there's a song we used to sing in church, and it said, Jesus is the key that opens the door. And it's true. I mean, so much of life is open to you, and so much of life is richer once you know Jesus. But there are people who are smarter than I am, and they have gathered information that says the older you get, the less likely you are to become a Christian. 85% of Christians became believers from between the age of 4 to 14. That's what the stat says. 10% of Christians became believers from age 15 to 30. And after age 30, only 4% of those adults will make a confession of faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that crazy? There are, of course, ex exceptions to this, and it doesn't mean, well, if, let's see, check your age. You're over 30. Forget it. I'm not going to tell you. I've wasted my time. No, don't ever do that, because you might be talking to one of them 4%ers, you know? <laughs> you might be talking to one of those people who are prime to get saved. But Jesus wasn't wrong when he said this in Luke 18, verse 17. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. And he also said in Matthew 18, 3, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of God or kingdom of heaven. Now, Jesus isn't saying to be childish. There are plenty of childish people around, aren't there? <laughs> He's saying to be childlike. That doesn't mean you have to be a child. And like once you're beyond being a child, well, 
it's hopeless. No, that's not what he's saying at all. So often when you tell children something, they just take your word for it. Because you're telling them something and why not believe it, especially if it's going to be fun, you know? In fact, they believe very easily. Jesus wants our hearts to believe him the way children do. And that's why it's easier to become a Christian when you're younger. Don't let old age and cynicism get in the way. You ever seen people, they're old, and you try to tell them, ah, Jesus, Jesus. You know, they might not say those words, but that's what they're meaning. They just blow it off. They don't care. They don't want to hear it. I've heard that before. You need to hear it again. <laughs> you know, you really do. So Solomon here says to remember our creator. And he isn't wrong, obviously. But he's still hanging on to his under the sun look at life. He doesn't say, remember now your savior, your Lord. He says creator. The basic thing that brought everything into life is a creator. Now, obviously, they're one and the same, but he's focusing on his under the sun, S-U-N, the bright light that's outside, even though it's behind, probably behind clouds right now. Yet, what we need to focus on is life under the sun, S-O-N, with a capital S in my Bible. Okay, so he says, do that. Remember now the creator in the days of youth. Before the difficult days come and the years draw near when you say, I have no pleasure in them. So what does Solomon mean here? Enjoy your youth before old age comes and life isn't as much fun. And he'll go on the next seven verses to explain that. It'll help us to understand this section if we realize Solomon is talking about old age because the words he uses, the phrases he uses won't make sense to us by themselves. Solomon writes this from the perspective of the young, not from the perspective of the old, but we'll look at it from the perspective of the old. So totally confused? hope so. Um, but he is referring to older people. So verse 2, while the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are not darkened, meaning what? One day they will be darkened. And I don't mean the actual sun and the moon and the stars. This is the Hebrew idiom that means before you get depressed, <laughs> as you get older, things can get you down. Even things that used to cheer you up. Shakespeare said, I wasted time, and now time doth waste me. <laughs> it's so true. Many old people become irritable, become cranky, become grumpy. It happens to me. My wife says, why are you so grumpy? I said, I'm not a no. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> and I realized that as the husband of the house, as the head of the house, I'm a barometer for the house. You see, my wife can be in a bad mood, and that's okay. My daughter can be in a bad mood. It's not really okay with the two of us, but it's okay with her. But if I'm in a bad mood, I ruin the mood of the house, and I have to get over it. And it's just a fact. It's true. It's not easy. I don't like it. I'm like the grumpy old man on Saturday Night Live. That's the way it was, and we liked it, you know? <laughs> not even the sun, the light, the moon, or the stars can cheer these people up. They're just cranky. Now, fortunately, I, mine comes and goes so far. Mostly, mostly goes, mostly is gone. But sometimes it hangs around. Sorry, hon. <laughs> and the clouds do not return after the rain. Now, in the Hebrew culture, this phrase means that as you grow older, your mind gets foggy. <laughs> your enjoyment of experiences gets less and less. And your recovery, if you do enjoy that experience, takes longer than it used to. I have personally experienced this. I remember even when I was a young guy, I went out, I used to go jogging. Do you guys remember jogging? Jim Fix wrote that complete book of running. You know, he died jogging. Just had a heart attack and died. I was like, wow, I bet he didn't put that in his book. <laughs> but anyway, so we lived in a place that um, it was one mile between traffic lights. So I thought maybe I'll run to the block and back, and that'd be half a mile. I felt so good, I went down to the mile, and then I could come back, and that'd be two. Well, I felt so good there. There was a mile square park in Fountain Valley, and you could go one, two, three, four miles around. So I went from one mile, two miles, three miles, four miles, five miles, and then six miles. I couldn't believe it, around six miles. I hadn't run in years. The next day, I could barely get out of bed. 
and I'm serious, my muscles. You know what lactic acid is? You probably don't, because I had it all in my body that day. It was so hard, I could barely lift my arms like, oh, why did I do that? Last night, I felt like Superman. Today, I feel like I have a kryptonite blanket on. It's just awful. You know those, you ever heard of a weighted blanket? Yeah, I think they put a whole engine block in one on me. It's just so heavy. Oh my goodness. So, <laughs> more physical breakdowns. Verse 3, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble. This is referring to your legs. <laughs> Our legs were once very strong. They took us everywhere. Hiking, skiing, running, walking. But as we age, we need more time. Well, we need help up. It's like, what is, they don't say, I, I'm walking and I, I haven't fallen. No, it's fallen and I can't get up. Our feet will swell with fluid and our knees and our ankles will ache. The, you ever had the bones, older folks, hopefully not the young so much, but the bones in your feet just hurt? You're just sitting around, it's like, I just put my foot up and why is my foot hurt now? I can see walking around, but it, it's like things are adjusting, fluid is going, it's just, it's not, Growing old is not for wimps, right? And strong men bow down. This means the shoulders. Many a person with square shoulders will eventually have more and more rounded shoulders. Let me tell you, you know why this happens? Because gravity wins. <laughs> We're constantly fighting that. And so does the weight of the world. Many people hunched over are just because they're carrying burdens they're probably not even designed to carry, but they do. And then here's a good one. When the grinders cease because they are few. It's referring to your teeth. The grinders, because they're few, they cease operating when there are few of them. Many people have fillings, crowns, bridge work, false teeth, dentures, and even dental implants. And I, in my mouth, have most of those right now. Because when I was a kid, I didn't take care of them grinders, and they started leaving me. They say, like the sign in the dentist office says, right? Ignore your teeth. They'll go away. <laughs> but without those things being available, we would not be able to grind food, right? You can't do a whole lot in your gums. And then, and those that look through the windows grow dim. I hate to say it, but this is referring to our eyesight. I remember when I first started pastoring over 18 years ago. I didn't wear glasses didn't need them. Sometimes I'd put on just reading glasses to study, but that was all I needed. You know, I was, was pretty happy. But I was smart enough to keep them up front in the pulpit. But then one Sunday morning, I looked down and I had a hard time reading my Bible. I had a hard time reading my notes and it wasn't the bigger print Bible that I have now. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I took the glasses out and I said, this is hard to do. And I put them on. And then I could see. Even though I was bummed out I had to put them on, I could see. That was good. And I looked up, and every person in the congregation was blurry. Focus, blurry, focus, blurry, blurry, focus, blurry, focus. It was opposite. I was like, what do I? It's more important to get this right and just hope the people are happy, you know? <laughs> oh, my gosh. So that solved the problem until I actually needed prescription eyeglasses. I went into the eye doctor, and he's very young. And I said, why is this happening? Why is it? I used to be able to focus. And now up here, even with my reading glasses on, it's blurry. And he went to this long, drawn-out explanation, basically about the muscles in your eyes that keep uh, developing. And so they, they pull and push against the lens, making it focus, and they fight against each other, and it doesn't let you do it as much at the extremes. And he basically said, we have a saying for that. It's called old man disease. I just about hit him with my cane. I mean, it was awful. <laughs> Verse 4, when the doors are shut in the streets, this is referring to our ears. The older we get, the worse our hearing gets. And as men get older, they actually have an excuse for not hearing their wives. <laughs> Rather than just, I actually have pretty good hearing. Um, it is selective, I'll agree. But I can hear pretty well. It's kind of like my dog. You know, I'll call him, boo, 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 Boo! I won't whistle as loud as I do for her. Boo! 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 And she's out there sniffing in the yard, and I just, I'm cold, I want to go in. But shut the door. She hears the door close, <laughs> scratches and claws and cries, she wants in. You know, when it's, you know, you, like I say, you can call her like that, but if you're in the kitchen and she's in the other room and you're trying to unwrap something, plastic, a snack, <laughs> they're like, hey! So that's how husbands are, right? <laughs> yeah. But hearing does start to go. In fact, I'm already getting hearing aid junk mail. 
don't know why. And then it says the sound of grinding is low. Now that you think, oh, the tea thing. No, it's another one. So even loud noises are becoming harder to hear as you get older. And then he says, when one rises up at the sound of a bird, which means you wake up early, the, the smallest things can wake you up. You used to be able to <clears throat> power nap through anything, power sleep through anything, and then it's a little, <clears throat> what? <laughs> you want to sleep late, but you can't. All, and all the daughters of music are brought low. This is talking about your own voice. As you age, your vocal cords simply don't function as well as they once did. It's true. Just think of the, the celebrities, movie stars or, or singers who live a long life. And maybe you haven't seen them for a while. And then they're on TV and they're talking like this. And you're like, really? Or they, they sing and they still look pretty good and everything when they sing, but they have to sing an octave lower. Or they, have to re, they can't sing it in the same key. I think of some singers that write songs, and the guys especially, and sing super high and I just think, man, when you get older, you're not going to be able to sing that way anymore. I hope that doesn't bother you. Because I try to sing along with them, and I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> or if it doesn't come out like that, no one wants to hear it. So it's bad. So your voice will go. Verse 5. Also, they are afraid of height. Many young people are fine with heights. Some people are scared. You know, but the people climb up a ladder, no problem. I remember when I first moved here, and I got that job in construction, and we were putting up the three-story BLM building. We are putting the wood siding on the outside. And so they rented a forklift. But you know forklifts have the, obviously they have forks on them and they lift. But they can also tilt and all that. But they have some that have side shift. That's handy. We didn't have side shift. So we parked it in the building like this and the ground was, was slanted. So we would put rocks on the ground, big rocks, and drive the forklift up on a rock so it would tilt enough to raise up and put it close to the building at the top. Super stable, OSHA approved. And then the forklift would be up as high as it could go, but we had another floor to go. So we built an eight foot frame out of two by fours with plywood on top, stood on that, and that wasn't high enough, and put sawhorses on the top of that so we could reach. This is called fun. So we're up there, and I'm shaking it like this, and it's going like this, and the guy next to me goes, stop it! He goes, I can't stand working with you Christians. I said, why? He goes, you aren't afraid to die. <laughs> so true. And now, although I'll get up on ladders, I'm very careful about reaching down. And once in a while, I'll think I'm on the bottom step, and I'm not. And I'll step down, and man, that's like 50 feet, it seems like. Oh! <laughs> And it's funny, too. Plane rides are out for some people when they get older. They don't want to do, even an elevator is scary for them, you know? I told this story before, but I just love it, so I'm going to do it again if you've heard it. Sorry. But there's a story. <laughs> I got in an elevator in Boise was doing, when I was a plumber and I'm working, doing service work. And I get in it. It's an old building. And there's a woman in the elevator with me. And the elevator's going in. It goes, <clears throat> as it's going up. I said, boy, I hope this thing doesn't get stuck between floors. He goes, <gasps> Don't say that. And I said, well, ma'am, I, I really don't think I have the kind of power to make that happen just by saying it. And she goes, yeah, you're probably right. <laughs> <laughs> but some of us get scared even in an elevator. And terrors, and, excuse me, and of terrors in the way. The older we get, the more we are afraid and we're cautious on trips, even to the store, and certainly going out alone scares people. A lot of fear is well-founded. In today's world, when we were kids, didn't our parents say, boy, this world's a mess. When we were kids, it was better. How about now? I mean, it's, it's heightened. So it's understandable. When you're a kid, you just think, no problem. I'll just go out and do that. You know, I remember getting mad at my daughter when she went somewhere with her friends on New Year's Eve. They went to the movies. We took them there. And we went to pick them up, and they weren't at the theater. And we couldn't find them. And we found them later. They decided to walk down to a coffee shop in downtown Boise on New Year's Eve. What could happen to young teenage girls out late at night, you know? When some people have had too much, um, what do we call it? Uh, spirits, yes. <laughs> Alcoholic beverages, too many. So anyway, they, they went down, and I got so upset. What do, you, do you have any idea what could have happened? This is back when they put faces on milk cartons, you know, kids. I said, do you know that... These kids didn't go out saying, hey, I want to become famous on a milk carton. No, they just said, let's go there and come back. And they didn't come back. 
Or kids get walk out in front of a car and they get killed. They didn't say, hey, let's go downtown so I can get killed in, by a car. What are you doing? I'm like, wow, your dad's really mad. And the one girl was like, didn't ring a bell with her at all. So they just think they're bulletproof. But as you get older, you don't. And this is when the almond tree blossoms. This is talking about white hair. If you're lucky enough to have any hair at all, if it's white, that's a blessing, right? When I started pastoring, my hair was thicker and it was pretty dark brown in color. And now look what's happened all from praying for you guys. So <laughs> now it's not either one. It's not thick and it's not dark brown. Okay, and then it says the grasshopper is a burden. This refers to how a grasshopper at the end of the season doesn't move very well. Older people are just slower and more deliberate. And it's funny because I'll get behind somebody, either they're driving or have a shopping cart in Albertsons and I'm trying to get around them and they're just, just moving along. I'm like, calm down. And yet it's funny because I'll move along and then some younger person will pass me and I think, oh my gosh, I'm that guy. <laughs> if I'm driving, I'm like, get out of the way, grandpa. And I know what I'm talking about because I'm a grandpa, so move. <laughs> But older people have to be slower. Their bodies aren't what they used to be. It's just true. It's happening. Things are, parts are falling off, you know? <laughs> just, things are happening. And then desire fails. Natural appetites diminish or they cease altogether. Food, not all foods will have the same flavor, the same zest, and basic other drives quit. If you're married, maybe physical passion for your mate, which would be very high on the list of younger people, is often diminished and in some respects, it's gone. And you're thinking, if you're younger, how could that ever happen? Wait till you get older, you find out. And then it says, for man goes to his eternal home and, as, and the mourners go about the streets. This is the end of it for everyone. If the rapture doesn't happen, we die and our bodies end up in the grave while people, for at least a short period of time, will walk the streets mourning us. It's such a chipper passage, isn't it? <laughs> Verse 6, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. This is an ancient term for the spinal cord. As we age, our spine starts malfunctioning. Vertebrae get out of place so easily. That's why chiropractors were invented. <laughs> I'm very fortunate in that one day I was at work. I don't even know when it was. It might even have been at Simplot's. Yeah, no, it was in California. I laid down on a bench and my back went, and I was like, oh, wow, that's nice. It popped it back into place. And I've, not everybody can do this, but I can adjust a lot of my own back myself. And I get like muscle pains and all kinds of problems. And usually if I wait that long, then I adjust it, then the muscles are hurting from, you know, they're trying to pull it back out because they're in a knot. It's, it's a whole chiropractic scene. But some things you can't, Fix yourself. you got to go somewhere. So your spine gets out of alignment. Um, gravity, again, causes our discs to deteriorate. As you go down your spine, each disc has more weight on it. And my, the bottom disc in my body, between my pelvis and the bottom vertebrae, whatever the number is and the letters, that disc is like 50% gone. And he says, and this does not regenerate. So we got to take care of what's left. So you can't let it get out of position and pinch more and, and deteriorate more and more. That's what happened when my back went out last year. It happens to everybody. And uh, nerves can get pinched. And that's when you get those back spasms, especially with a pinched nerve. And you think, oh, I can power through that. No problem. You know, this arm hurts. I'll just make it. If you have that kind of pain, you try it and you go, Bloop, and your body just goes, no. <laughs> like you try to stand up and it's like you're on ice. You go, whoa. <laughs> you start to go down. It's bad. It's hard on you. And pain goes up as your spine works less and less correctly, if that is even a sentence. And so sometimes slumping over is just easier, feels better. Your spine is getting loosed. And it says, or the golden bowl is broken. This seems pretty clear. This refers to our brain. <laughs> we don't remember as well as we used to. At least it takes longer than before. Pastor Chuck, again, the pastor of the First Calvary Chapel said, some commentators will say you forget things after a while. He says, I don't think you ever forget anything you've ever learned. It's just in filing cabinets somewhere in your head. And you got a guy that's assigned to your, that region, and there are guys all over, but he goes to that region, and he's pulling out a drawer, and he's pretty old, too, because he's as old as you are. So it takes a while to look through, and he goes, nope, not in that drawer. 
And he pulls out another drawer, and he's looking at like 2.30 in the morning. He goes, here it is. And you go, Jane, that's her name. Her name is Jane, or whatever. You know, just out of the blue, you remember, because the guy found that file. It's still there. If you don't think that's true, have you ever smelled something, and all of a sudden you're six years old? Or at least you remember when you smelled it at your grandma's when you were six years old? It happens. But it takes longer because more stuff is crammed in there. Your brain is like a hoarder. <laughs> and there's just only so much room, so it gets jammed. It's hard to get it out. And some people have brains, this is sad, it's true, that forget completely. They can even forget family and friends. I saw a thing that was so touching. It said a husband it had a picture of him walking with a woman, holding her hand, and she's like this, with her arm <coughs> out. And it says, why... This is husband and wife. He says, they said, why do you take her out for a walk? She says, well, she's my love. And he says, what's going on? He says, well, she doesn't remember me anymore. We've been married for like 60 years, and she doesn't know who I am. They said, why do you take her for walks? He goes, she's my wife. She's my love. I love her. Why wouldn't I? But she, does, she has no idea who he is. That does happen. Alzheimer's, old, old timers, some people call it. But dementia. the younger people, dementia, exactly, the younger people, the people who don't have it in their family, whatever, can joke about stuff like that. Uh, it's a common thing to make fun of, but when it happens and it's real, it's frightening. The golden bowl can get broken. Or the pitcher shattered at the fountain. Apparently this refers to our lungs. The average person breathes, you ready for this? 23,040 times every 24 hours. <sighs> Makes you take a deep breath, and again, Think about Dylan. Every time he wants to breathe, he can't exhale properly. It's just amazing. Now, when you're young, deep breaths are easy. When I go to the doctor now, he says, deep breath. I'm like, oh, boy. <gasps> no, I don't do that noise, but I try very hard to just sound normal. But he's like, you'll never sound normal. It's you. So <laughs> but when you get older, deep breaths are harder to come by. You ever had that time when you try to get that deep breath, and it's like you can only get like 75 to 80 percent, you know there's more. It's like you have to go, like you have to go, <gasps> force it. Oh, okay, there it is. And it, when you're a kid, it's no problem. Shortness of breath is commonplace. And then it says, or the wheel broken at the well. This refers to the heart. Yes, hearts can break at any age, as far as emotionally. Quite a bit we get our hearts broken, but when it actually begins to break down, you get, what do they call it? Uh, arrhythmia and irregular heartbeats and, of course, heart attacks and um, bypass surgery. That's when you start getting in serious trouble. Our hearts pump blood through 168 million miles of veins, arteries, and capillaries every day. Do you have to sit around and think? I hope you don't. Is my heart beating? Is it gone? In fact, I get irritated because, speaking of old, the hair that grows out of my ears now when I lay on my side of my pillow, it's like speaker wire from the heart, and, and I can hear my heart beat. Boom, boom, boom. To lay on my back, to shave that out, I can't stand that. It's crazy. Getting older is so weird. And then you get older, blood vessels become restricted, which causes your heart to work harder. Blood pressure is either too high or too low, the heart can beat irregularly. Heart attacks are too common and of, often deadly. I mentioned Jim Fix having that complete book of running, had a heart attack, boom, fell over. My wife knew a gal, younger gal, and her husband was out jogging, and she drove by and saw the emergency vehicles and stuff by the road. She said, oh, that's too bad, and that was her husband. He had a heart attack, boom, died, aneurysm, whatever, blew. Before he even hit the ground, he was gone that quickly. <sighs> so the end result of all this, being young, Looking, this is what can happen to you. Verse 7, then the dust will return to the earth as it was. This means we are all headed for death. Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. We are dust, and one day we'll be dust in the wind, dude. Genesis 3, 9, in the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you shall return. That's when God is cursing, putting a curse on Adam. But this dusty existence is not all there is. He says, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. As Stephen was being stoned to death in Acts seven fifty nine, he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. See, our bodies one day will 
die, but our spirits, our soul is eternal. As one guy says, you don't have a soul, you are a soul. You have a body, <laughs> but you are a soul. God gave us our spirits, and if you're a born-again believer in Jesus as Savior and Lord, your spirit does, does return to him. It goes back to him. He created you, and it goes back to him when you die. Now, aging is inevitable if you live that long. <laughs> But we shouldn't try to escape it. We shouldn't try to mask it. How many times have we seen plastic surgery gone bad? People with Botox-filled lips look more like a duck's bill. <laughs> See, actually, I like being older. I'd enjoy it more if I felt better physically. That's true. But I like how much smarter I am now than when I was 20. Amen. She says so, yeah. Most of the intelligence was drilled in by her training me to be the best husband I could be. No, really, I, I am a lot smarter now than I was when I was 20. You, you get the new and improved version of me. You don't have to deal with what my wife had when we were first married. Um, you can ask her what, no, baby, you shouldn't. Um, when our son was born, and I was 20, so was she, and I said, does this mean I have to grow up? She said, no, and I think she's regretted that ever since. But after looking at all this life and death here under the sun, S-U-N, Solomon comes to the same conclusion he had in the second verse of the first chapter of Ecclesiastes. Verse 8 says, vanity of vanities, says the preacher, all is vanity. Trying to escape aging is a vain thing to do. It's like trying to catch the wind. It's an empty endeavor. You won't be able to do it because no one gets out of here alive. But Solomon, as old as as he was, and most likely at the time he was, he wrote this, he still taught. Verse 9, and moreover, because the preacher was wise, he still taught the people knowledge. Yes, he pondered and sought out and set in order many proverbs. So as we age, we should get smarter. I think we do. And here Solomon's teaching them is an example to us that you do get smarter. And we should pass on what we know. I know my son-in-law I don't work as a plumber anymore, but he asked me if I could come down and give him some advice at a place he's working at where he's the maintenance guy. And I said, I might as well, because first of all, I have a little bit of time and all this knowledge is up in here. And when I die, it's going to stay. So I might as well pass it on to people. That's what we should be doing. We older Christians, we have a lot to give to younger people. We can't hoard it for ourselves. It's not right. Verse 10, the preacher sought to find acceptable words and what was written was upright, words of truth. He didn't waste time with false teaching. Even during this time of backsliding in his life and looking at life under the sun, S-U-N, instead of life under the S-O-N, he still had truth in his heart. So he only taught truths. If we only teach when we're, we're doing perfectly with God, we'll never teach. We're all sinners. This is not an encouragement to sin, so your teaching will be great. What it is is this. Teach the truth at all times. Yes. Truth is truth. No matter how well you are dealing with it, no matter how well you're obeying it, it's still true. That doesn't mean, again, go out and sin because, you know, like Paul said that. Should we sin more that we get more grace? No! Don't do that. <laughs> Stop it. This is where the grace of God comes in. He teaches us truths, even though he knows we won't follow them perfectly, he still wants us to tell others about him. That's why we're having Greg Glory come up here. Okay, verse 11. The words of the wise are like goads, and the words of scholars are like well-driven nails given by one shepherd. Goads, that's a wooden stick usually with a metal point on it, a metal tip, and they poke the animal in the back end. Goad, that's why people say I got goaded into doing it. I wasn't wanting to, but someone encouraged me. That's what that means. Well-driven nails build the structure the best. I remember when I was 20, speaking of 20 and being smarter than everybody on the planet, I was first learning carpentry from my father-in-law, and I chased the heads of many nails for a long time, driving them in, ding, 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 and they would bend, and I'd go over here and straighten them, and he's just like... <laughs> but eventually, I got much better, and they were well-driven nails. And you'll be the same way with sharing the gospel. The more you share it, the better you get at it. Okay, verse 12, and further, my son, be admonished by these, of making many books there is no end, and much study is wearisome to the flesh. This is what Solomon is saying here, I, as if this is a quote. I could go on and on in my pursuit of happiness and fulfillment here on earth. I could write many more books about it, but I'm worn out. I'm done. 
I have reached the end of my studies on what will bring fulfillment in life. Because he found there wasn't any without God. So Solomon finally gave up and he gave in in verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Solomon tried getting back to nature, wisdom and philosophy, pleasure and materialism. He experimented with fatalism. He tried living for self. He turned to religion and found ritual but no reality. He then tried to find the answer in wealth. And last of all, Solomon tried to live the good moral life. Solomon had every resource in the world to find satisfaction, to find meaning in life. The richest man who ever lived under the sun, and he found none. All these things were fun for a while, but none of these things brought him lasting satisfaction. So what could his conclusion be? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is man's all. Of all the conclusions Solomon could come to, he got this right. This is the best one. Since this is the conclusion of the entire book, I want to break it down. Just take a few minutes here. First, we have to know what fear God means. It does not mean we should be scared of him. Like Adam and Eve in the garden. Where were you? Adam. He goes, well, I was in the, I heard you coming. I could hear you coming. I was naked, so I hid. I was afraid. <laughs> I don't want that for you. I don't, want, I don't like that. What it does mean is we should revere and worship and obey him. Fearing God is not the same as getting saved. First, we yield to him as Savior and Lord. Then after we're born again, we learn about him and realize he is a God to be feared. And then we properly revere, worship, and obey him. If we do, we'll be acting in actually a progressively smart way. Solomon also wrote many of the Proverbs and three or three quotes. Proverbs 1.7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. You start fearing God, you're getting smarter. <laughs> Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So not only smart, but wise, which is the application. And then Proverbs 15.3, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom. So fearing the Lord takes you from the beginning of knowledge to the beginning of wisdom to the instruction of wisdom. Oswald Chambers said the remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. When you don't fear God, you fear everything else. It's a great quote. And De Derek Kidner said, Fear God is a call that puts us in our place, and all other fears, hopes, and adm adm <laughs> Fear God is a call <laughs> that puts us in our place, and all our fears, hopes, and admirations in their place. And then he says, And keep his commandments. Boy, this one is so easy and so tough at the same time. Because I think for each and every Christian, there are commandments that are easy to obey. It's just true. It's not hard. There's no struggle. And for every Christian, there are commandments that are easier to disobey. But God's standard is 100% complete, perfect obedience. Jesus said in John 14, 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. Every born-again Christian loves Jesus and wants to obey his commandments. But that's where grace comes in. That's why Jesus said the price is paid. It's full, taken care of. He says, verse 14, For God will bring every good work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. Now, how can God do that? Well, it's easy for him. Proverbs 15, 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. God sees everything we do. God hears everything we say. God even knows everything we think and why we thought it. We might think we know why we thought something or said something or did something, but he knows the real reason. And every action will be judged. For the Christian, we'll be rewarded, not punished, for, the, for what we've done for the Lord. For the non-believer, they will be judged by God for their sins. Now, why won't Christians be judged for our sins, for their sins? Because Jesus was judged for our sins in our place on the cross. And as he was hanging there, I've said this before, but he said, it is finished, yeah. paid in full. What he didn't say was, it's mostly done, the rest is up to you, good luck. <laughs> it's taken care of. That's how you can rest. That's how you have grace, you understand grace, and that's where you get peace, mm -hmm. understanding that. 
And that's why it's so important to fear God and keep his commandments. I call this message following the directions. And Solomon tells us right here at the end what that means. Fear God and keep his commandments. But that's man's all. That's it. That's everything. Now you think one little sentence, that's life. Yeah. Bible's that basic, that simple, that hard to follow at the same time, right? I just want to do a show of hands. Who here, I shouldn't put mine up, who here can totally obey God at all times? Who here enjoys the grace of God who forgives you and loves you even though you don't? That's the God that we serve. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for being our God. Thank you for being our Father. Thank you for being our Savior. As we have sung before in songs, you've come to our rescue when we didn't even realize we needed you, you rescued us. So we thank you for this book of Ecclesiastes. We thank you for Solomon's look at life under the sun, looking at life left and right, looking around at what's here. And the reason I thank you for that is because a lot of us do that. A lot of us find dissatisfaction in life. A lot of us find problems, hardships. Why, why, why? When really what we should be focusing on is who, 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 and that's you. So thank you for loving us. Thank you for putting this book out. Thank you for telling us that if we fear you and love you and keep your commandments, that's all we need to do. In Jesus' name, amen.